Hello, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's Streaming Only History is Lunch program. We're working safely with a skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. I hope that you will join us next Wednesday when we'll live stream filmmaker Wilma Mosley Clopton presenting Mississippi Justice Then and Now, which will feature a screening of her new documentary about a 1951 Pike County murder trial. Today, we are delighted to welcome back Jeff Gambrone, who over the years has given many standout History as Lunch programs, some centering on the Civil War, World War I, and even the first motion picture film made in Mississippi. Today, he'll present Pledged to One Country and One Flag, the Grand Army of the Republic in Mississippi. Jeff Gambrone is a native of Bolton, he earned a bachelor's degree in history from Mississippi State University and a master's in history from Mississippi College. Gambrone works as a reference librarian in the state archives. He is the author of four books, Beneath Torn and Tattered Flags, A Regimental History of the 38th Mississippi Infantry CSA, An Illustrated Guide to the Vicksburg Campaign and National Military Park, Remembering Mississippi's Confederates, and Vicksburg and the War, co-authored with Gordon Cotton. If you have questions for Jeff, you can ask them in the comments of this live stream, and we'll put those to him at the end of his talk. Now, here's Jeff Gambro. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, this is a somewhat smaller crowd than I've had in uh, <laughs> previous uh, History as Lunch talks, but I hope there's a lot of people out there that are uh, watching on uh, Facebook. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the, the Grand Army of the Republic in Mississippi, and it's not a topic that most people know very much about. Uh, this organization had a national reach, but uh, its time in Mississippi uh, has not been written about very much. I personally got interested in the Grand Army of the Republic when I found that I had a relative that was a member of the organization. My great-great-uncle, uh, Miles S. Adams from Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, served in the Civil War. He was an officer in the 3rd Michigan Infantry. And after the war, uh, he uh, went back to Grand Rapids and became a member of Post Number 5, the Custer Post of the Grand Army of the Republic. And it kind of piqued my interest when I, when I found out I had a relative in, in the organization. I wanted to know a little bit more about it. So I started, started doing some reading, doing some research. And then over the course of my time here at the archives, uh, I started turning up references to uh, the Grand Army of the Republic in Mississippi. And uh, that was kind of uh, a shock. I didn't realize uh, that uh, the Grand Army had posts here in Mississippi. But as I started doing more research, I found that, yes, indeed, they had a very large and vibrant presence in the state of Mississippi. And today, I'm just going to be telling you a little bit about uh, uh, the organization as it, uh, as it uh, uh, manifested itself in, in our state. And to begin with, I'm just going to give you a little brief background on the Grand Army of the Republic as an organization. The Grand Army of the Republic was founded on April 6, 1866 in Decatur, Illinois by Benjamin Franklin Stevenson, who had served as a surgeon in the 14th Illinois Infantry during the Civil War. And this is a picture of uh, Dr. Stevenson. Now, Dr. Stevenson came up with the idea for the Grand Army of the Republic while he was taking part in William T. Sherman's Meridian Expedition in 1864. Uh, there are no known uh, wartime images of the Meridian Expedition, so I, I lifted a lithograph of Sherman's uh, Atlanta, uh, or March to the Sea in Georgia. Uh, the Meridian Expedition was, in a lot of ways, a uh, trial run for the March to the Sea, so it seems very appropriate. And the action you see taking place in that lithograph would have been very similar to what happened as uh, Sherman marched across the state, starting in uh, Vicksburg and uh, marching uh, across the state all the way to Meridian. During the Meridian Expedition, Dr. Stevenson spent much of his time with this man, Chaplain William J. Rutledge, who was chaplain of the 14th Illinois Infantry. He was his tent mate, and the two spent a lot of time uh, during their, their off hours talking. 
And one uh, member of the JAR, Hosea W. Rood, who was a veteran of the 12th Wisconsin, later wrote a history of, how, of the founding of the organization. And he wrote about uh, these two gentlemen. He said, these two comrades were men of vision. They felt that the sentiment of patriotism should be cultivated among the citizens of the Republic, both old and young, in order that another war between the sections of our country might be made impossible. They agreed that no organized effort could better encourage and strengthen such patriotic sentiment than an association of those men who had proved their patriotism by their self-sacrificing service in the war for the Union. They dwelt much upon the good they hoped would come through an organization. They even went so far as to outline in their thoughts a ritual for use in their proposed association of Civil War veterans. Now, the membership requirements for the Grand Army of the Republic were pretty simple. Uh, the first rule, you had to show a good moral character. Second, you had to be honorably discharged from the Union Army. Third, you had to have served in the military between April 12, 1861 and April 9, 1865. And fourth, an applicant could never have borne arms against the United States government. And shown here in the picture is uh, a honorable discharge for a Union soldier uh, showing that he had indeed served in the Army during the Civil War and had been honorably discharged. Now, each applicant who wanted to become a member of the Grand Army of the Republic had to apply to his local post and his admission would be voted on by the members uh, using the old system of a white ball and a black ball. White ball, yes. Black ball, no. And if you got one black ball in the vote, uh, you were out. So when a veteran joined the Grand Army of the Republic, they became a member of their local post. And posts were often named after the city or town that the post was, was located in. They could also be named after a prominent Civil War person, such as General Ulysses S. Grant, General William T. Sherman, any number of the, of the big you know, names of the Civil War. They could also be named after a local personages who had, who had uh, uh, made a name for themselves during the Civil War, someone that uh, showed bravery, had, that had received the Medal of Honor, someone in their local town that had died in the war. So th there were lots of different names that were used for these posts. The Grand Army of the Republic uh, posts were made up from a single state or sometimes, in the, particularly in the case of the South, of several adjacent states, which made up a department. Uh, the department, in turn, was answerable to the Grand Army of the Republic Commander-in-Chief, who was elected by the rank-and-file members. Each local post was led by a commander, his second in command was the vice commander, and other post officials uh, included the adjutant, who served as the, the post secretary, the quartermaster, who served as the treasurer, and, and the, uh, the post chaplain. Uh, and unfortunately, there are no surviving GAR halls in Mississippi that I'm aware of, uh, so I have uh, found a photograph of a nice surviving GAR hall from South Carolina and this is a very good representative example of what a, a standalone GAR hall might have looked like. And this one, I believe, was built about 1896. The ritual that the Grand Army of the Republic followed in each of its posts was based partly on Freemasonry, which was extremely popular in the 19th century. It was also partly based on military, military traditions and practices that the men were familiar with from their time in the Union Army. Uh, posts were made up of a minimum of 15 men, and uh, those in larger areas, particularly large cities, would often have quite, quite a number more than that. Uh, a lot of the posts uh, had elaborate post halls. Uh, they might have collections of Civil War relics on display. Some of the larger ones even had lending libraries for its members. So some, some of the, these posts were, were quite elaborate. They also would have social gatherings at the post where men could reminisce about their wartime service, where they would have 
uh, commemorations of members that had passed away. They would have uh, holiday celebrations. Uh, the GAR post uh, uh, served a number of functions in the community. And uh, shown in this picture is the interior of a surviving GAR hall in Pennsylvania, just to give you an idea of what the interior looked like of one. And uh, also in this picture is the uh, statue uh, um, showing here is the Stevenson Grand Army of the Republic Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is really a, a massive and very impressive monument. If you ever get to Washington, it's well worth your time to, to take a look at it. Not all GAR posts in Mississippi had their own post hall. Uh, many of them rented rooms or made use of rooms in established businesses. Uh, for example, uh, Vicksburg Post No. 7, when they organized in 1889, met in the hall of the Firemen's Charitable Association. And uh, later they would meet in the Vicksburg and Greenville Packet Company. So uh, some, some posts that didn't have the, the financial means to build their own, their own post hall would just make use of a room in an already existing building. Uh, some posts, however, in Mississippi did, did either build or buy the, uh, their post hall. Uh, E.D. Edwards Post, number 22 in Vicksburg, uh, purchased the unused Seventh-day Adventist Church at 300 West 1st East Street and turned it into their post hall. Um, I was not able to find a picture of it, but I did find a schematic of the outline of the building from the Sanborn Fire Insurance map of 1902 for Vicksburg. And fortunately, I was able to find a description of the building and a brief listing of the contents because in 1904, the post hall caught fire and burned down. The uh, unfortunate post had insurance, which lapsed the day of the fire. And uh, they claimed that the, the insurance was still in effect, so they sued their, their insurance carrier. And we have the case here at Archives and History. And the nice thing about it, it gives a complete list of the contents and a description of the building, and it gives a list of all the members of the post. So it's very useful for, our, for history of, of the Grand Army to have this sort of document because uh, documentation on GAR posts in Mississippi is rather lacking. Uh, a lot of it depend, is depending on how good the newspapers were in the area where the post was as to how much you're going to find. But uh, from this court case, I was able to find a description of the post hall. It said the post was a one-story frame shingle roof building and was at the time of its destruction worth at least $800. That it had a pulpit, benches, chairs, stoves, books, desks, lamps, flags, banners, drums, and other furniture and fixtures worth at the time of its destruction by fire, $338.50. And to give you an idea, in 2019 dollars, when I, when I calculated this, uh, the total loss of the building and its contents in today's dollars would be about $32,794. So the, the E.D. Edwards Post had a lot of money invested in their GAR hall. It was a, a, a source of pride for these men, and, and they, they built it up as nicely as they could. And the Grand Army of the Republic was guided by a set of principles. And these principles were fraternity, charity, and loyalty. The first ideal, fraternity, was encouraged by regular meetings held by the local posts and the local department, and also by the national gatherings that the, the organization held each year. The second principle, charity, was followed by setting up relief funds for needy veterans and their widows, uh, also uh, for orphans of uh, Civil War uh, veterans. The GAR was also very active in promoting veterans and orphans homes and pensions for needy veterans and their widows. The third ideal, loyalty, was encouraged by reminding the civilian population of the sacrifices that had been made for them by the Union soldiers. They did this by building monuments and memorials, by having elaborate ceremonies to honor the war dead, particularly around Memorial Day. And uh, through the, the, the application of these principles, the GAR really made themselves a strong part of their local community. <coughs> Uh, 
The Grand Army of the Republic was established in the Magnolia State in 1870 with the creation of the Department of Mississippi. The first department commander uh, was this gentleman, Jonathan Tarbell, who was named the department commander. Uh, his assistant adjutant general was a man named Charles L.C. Cass. And shown here on the left is a picture of Jackson about the time that uh, Tarbell was taking over as uh, department commander. And as you can see, there was still quite a bit of, of ruins left from the destruction of Jackson during the war. Uh, this picture shows the old capital in the distance. Here in the foreground are the ruins of the Bowman House Hotel, which had burned uh, in 1863. So for the people of Jackson, uh, the Civil War was still very much alive in their memory. They had not forgotten, and uh, the GAR was going to have some difficult times with a lot of the local citizenry because they were uh, still, they remembered the war, and uh, they were not at all comfortable with, uh, with the Grand Army of the Republic. Now, Jonathan Tarbell, who was the first department commander, was a native New Yorker. He had served as an officer in the 24th and the 91st New York Infantries. He had been breveted Brigadier General uh, at the end of the war for gallant and meritorious service. He was commissioned a judge of the Mississippi Supreme Court in 1870, and he served until 1876, and he was a resident of Jackson at this time. And under his leadership, two posts of the Grand Army of the Republic were established in Mississippi. The first was named the George H. Thomas Post, named after this man, uh, General George H. Thomas. And this, uh, this was uh, George H. Thomas Post Number 1, which was organized in early 1870 in Jackson, uh, named after General George H. Thomas, a native Virginian who had stayed with the Union when the Civil War began. This name uh, uh, for the local J.R. Post probably did not sit well with a lot of uh, Jacksonians. Uh, the memories of the war were still very vivid, and uh, particularly with... Uh, uh, Thomas being a native Southerner who had stayed in the Union Army, uh, I'm sure the name did not sit well with a lot of them. And in fact, uh, General Thomas uh, died in April 1870, and uh, our local paper, the Clarion Ledger, wrote the following uh, uh, in his obituary. They, the Clarion Ledger said, General George H. Thomas is dead. It will be remembered that he was a native of Virginia but remained in the federal service and joined with the vandals who overrun and oppressed his people. So they made it pretty plain how they felt. And so th this was going to cause some friction uh, in, the, in the local area. Uh, the second post uh, was the McPherson Post No. 2 in Vicksburg, named for General James B. McPherson, uh, who had been killed in the Battle of Atlanta. And as, as I mentioned before, during Reconstruction, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic was going to be a flashpoint in many ways for white Southerners uh, who were angry and resentful over the changes being forced on them in regards to their relations with their former slaves. Many members of the Grand Army of the Republic were involved in state government, and they were trying to bring about these changes, and uh, local whites made their hostility very apparent. In the April 20th, 1870 edition of the Hines County Gazette, the following was written about uh, uh, Jonathan Tarbell and, and the Grand Army of the Republic. And they wrote, the impropriety of judges of courts participating in political movements is forcibly shown in the matter now referred to at length in a number of our state papers before us. A political so society composed exclusively of Northern men exists at Jackson known as the Grand Army of the Republic or something of the sort, of which Honorable J. Tarbell, judge of the circuit court district, is president or vice president. And in this particular case, the uh, paper was upset with Tarbell because he was about to hear the case of Henry Sizer, uh, who was a, uh, a merchant in Jackson. He sold buggies, rockaways, uh, other uh, items of that sort. In fact, this is an ad from the New Jackson newspaper from about that time for Henry Sizer's business. Anyway, Sizer uh, had been accused of murdering a Jackson police officer named James Tuck. Uh, Tuck was a former Union soldier. Uh, he was uh, a police officer in the city of Jackson. He was also a member of the, the GAR post in Jackson. And uh, 
this case really uh, helped to stoke a lot of resentment against the, the GAR in the, in the state. And Sizer was, uh, was tried and, and found guilty, uh, which from all the accounts, it, there was no doubt about his guilt. Uh, Tuck had uh, come into his, uh, his business, asked him to remove some carriages that he had that were on the street that were blocking uh, traffic, and uh, Sizer j pulled out a shotgun and just shot him dead. There was no, it wasn't any nuances about it. It was just straight up murder. There was also a loud outcry from many white Southerners in May 1870 when there was an adjournment of the state legislature at the invitation of the Grand Army of the Republic to attend the Memorial Day observance at the Vicksburg National Cemetery. And uh, under the headline, A Public Outrage, the Clarion Ledger wrote the following. It said, in response to the invitation of a political organization known as the Grand Army of the Republic, the mongrel majority in the legislature forced an adjournment to participate in the ceremony of decorating the graves of federal soldiers at Vicksburg on Monday. This proceeding has cost the taxpayers several thousand dollars. That's from the, the Clarion Ledger, June 2nd, 1870. Uh, I really don't think that the Clarion Ledger was too concerned about the cost uh, to, the, to the state. Uh, they were more concerned about uh, the legislature taking off to formally uh, uh, take part in the ceremony uh, for Union war dead. Because uh, I know in, in the years to follow, uh, the legislature often took off for Confederate holidays and, and Confederate memorials. So I think it was more a matter of who was being memorialized rather than, than the cost to the state. As Reconstruction wound down in Mississippi, uh, federal troops were withdrawn from the state and white Mississippians uh, used violence and intimidation to take control of the state government again. Uh, this newspaper headline shown here is from the Weekly Time Democrat Times in Greenville, uh, no November 6, 1875. Uh, predeeming that the state had been redeemed. In other words, it was under white democratic control once again. Uh, with the federal soldiers leaving, uh, the two GAR, GAR posts in the Mississippi disbanded about 1873. It's hard to tell an exact date because they just kind of fade away. There's no, not much documentation other than uh, just going by when they just fade out of the newspapers completely. And it was a, sometime in, in about 1873, and they would not return to the state for a good decade and a half. But as time went on and uh, the war got a little bit further in the rearview mirror, uh, more Union veterans were going to settle in the South, and the GAR began to make a resurgence in the region. The Department of the Gulf, Grand Army of the Republic was formed in 1884, and that uh, Department of the Gulf included Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, William Roy was elected the first commander, and in 1888 they changed the name of the department to uh, the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, anticipating the creation of, of posts in, in the state of Mississippi. At, the t at that time of the name change, uh, Commander Jacob Gray, who's shown in the picture here, was the com department commander, and he was going to oversee the creation of the very first GAR post in the state. In May 1889, uh, General Jacob Gray, uh, the department commander, traveled to Vicksburg to participate in a Memorial Day observance. Uh, this is going to take place at the Vicksburg National Cemetery. Uh, he had uh, uh, ulterior motives in mind, though. He wasn't there just to celebrate the Memorial Day. He was also there to help uh, inaugurate the, the uh, uh, first JAR post in the state uh, since Reconstruction. And he was successful in this effort. Uh, the, the first post, uh, Vicksburg Post Number 7, uh, was chartered. And the, the Vicksburg Evening Post wrote about the, the chartering. They said, they had uh, 11 charter members were enrolled and many others will join later. The office of the commander was left vacant because the gentleman desired for that position is out of town. The election will take place on his return and he will appoint his adjutant. Numerous contributions of flowers were sent to the hall for the post today. 
A handsome basket of flowers bearing a card to the GAR from a rebel girl was especially admired. And uh, uh, this post would have uh, unusually good uh, relations with the local Confederate veterans. And uh, that's going to become a bone of contention in time, but uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But the gentleman they wanted for the, the uh, post commander was this man, uh, Frederick Speed. He had been a Union officer during the war, had served in a Maine uh, regiment, and uh, he had been in Vicksburg in 1865 as the war was winding down and had been one of the officers in charge of loading uh, paroled Union prisoners on board the steamboat Sultana. Unfortunately, the Sultana exploded north of Memphis, uh, and it was one of the largest losses of life uh, in U.S. maritime history. Uh, the only person to be tried for this disaster was Speed. He was put on trial at Vicksburg, uh, was convicted by a court-martial, and uh, uh, was uh, uh, dishonorably discharged from service. But uh, uh, he did have, uh, or was able to get the, the, uh, the findings of the, the, the court overturned, and he was reinstated. So uh, Speed uh, must have been a very good lawyer, or had a very good lawyer, but uh, he ended up staying in Vicksburg after the war, uh, became a local judge, and was a very highly respected member of the community. So it's not unusual that they would have sought him to be their, their first post commander. Now, the Vicksburg Post only had 11 members when it was chartered uh, in 1889, but it would grow over time uh, to have about 34 members. It's a little hard to say for certain because I haven't found any existing rosters, but what I've been able to, to verify so far, I found they, they had somewhere around 34 members, all, all of them white. Soon after it was established, uh, the Vicksburg Post of the, the Grand Army of the Republic set itself a very uh, ambitious task. They teamed up with the local Confederate veterans to help promote a blue-gray reunion for the city of Vicksburg in 1890. Uh, to accomplish this task, they joined with uh, Camp 32 of the United Confederate Veterans, and uh, between the two, uh, the GAR and the UCV, they both began putting out the word nationwide, uh, urging veterans, both Union and Confederate, to come to Vicksburg in 1890 for this grand reunion. In fact, uh, the local paper noted that, uh, quote, the GAR representatives are much pleased with the, the re their reception by the ex-Confederates, which was both cordial and without reservation, and predict that the contemplated reunion will be the grandest event of its kind ever seen. So both, both groups sent out word of the, the uh, encampment that was going to be held at, at uh, Vicksburg. Uh, the invitation to attend was accepted by uh, the Grand Army of the Republic at its national convention in Milwaukee, which was held in September 1889. It was also accepted by John Gordon, head of the United Confederate Veterans. And so you had both uh, organizations agreeing to meet uh, for this, this grand reunion, which did take place uh, in from May 25th to 30th, 1890 in Vicksburg. And in fact, I've shown here in the picture, these are the reunion ribbons. Uh, the one on the left here used by the uh, Union veterans, the one on the right, uh, the ribbon for the Confederate veterans. And uh, from all the, the newspaper accounts, the reunion was a tremendous success. Uh, the Daily uh, Commercial Herald wrote uh, that the old veterans were, quote, assembled at the cotton exchange to obtain badges, and all over the streets, knots of veterans were to be seen in earnest conversation, fighting their battles over again, while many others uh, visited the entrenchments occupied by them during the siege and recalled those terrible days to memory, dimmed by the passage of 27 years. And uh, this picture uh, that I showed here is the Vicksburg waterfront, taken uh, a few years after the 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 1890 reunion, but it would have looked very much the same for the veterans that were coming in by water or by rail uh, to Vicksburg. So a very large crowd attended the reunion, and uh, the Vicksburg Evening Post noted in its edition uh, that on the opening day of the, of the event, it said, uh, today is the opening day of the reunion. Still, the hotels are full and more accommodations are needed. 
And one of the highlights of the reunion was the placement of over 16,000 flags on the Union graves out in the Vicksburg National Cemetery for all of the Union graves. And one of the dignitaries on hand for that occasion was uh, General John S. Kuntz, who was the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. He was also a uh, member uh, or a recipient of the Medal of Honor. He had been a drummer boy in the 37th Ohio Infantry, and his bravery at the Battle of Missionary Ridge uh, had resulted in, in him receiving the Medal of Honor. The Blue-Gray reunion had uh, started off a new decade on a good note for the Grand Army of the Republic in Mississippi, but unfortunately there was a huge controversy brewing. That same year, 1890, uh, Jacob Gray, the commander of the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi, authorized the creation of flat, five black Grand Army of the Republic posts in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi. And uh, to say this set off a firestorm of protest is, is an understatement. Uh, all of the departments, in, uh, all of the posts in the department up to this time were white, and they were under very considerable social pressure to conform to local customs concerning African Americans. They were worried, particularly the white, white uh, Mississippians were worried that black GAR posts might lead to black departmental officers having leadership over white men. And this was something that white Southerners were just not going to tolerate. And really, the opposition of white Union veterans to black posts in the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi cannot be understated. And they had, they had legitimate reasons for, their, uh, for the, their feeling this way. These men were living in the South. Uh, in many cases, they had married Southern wives. Their businesses were dependent on uh, Southern uh, customers. And as one JR member from Louisiana, uh, John A. Brookshire, put it, he said, I don't know whether you understand the prejudice that we had to contend with, the social ostracism we had to go through when we admitted them into the posts. And uh, this, cert this sentiment was certainly true with uh, a number of the members of Vicksburg Post Number 7 uh, because they had gone to a, a lot of pains to try and fit in with uh, the local white citizenry. Uh, for example, in 1891, uh, Vicksburg Post num Number 7 made a, a public protest against the appointment of African-American James Hill as postmaster at Vicksburg. Uh, the Daily uh, Commercial Herald wrote that... Uh, this action by uh, Vicksburg Post Number 7 was, quote, uh, quite generally commented on and complimented yesterday, though no one expected any surprise at the course adopted by the representative citizens who were comprised in the Grand Army organization here. Vicksburg Post Number 7 had also developed very close ties to Camp 32 of the United Confederate Veterans in Vicksburg. Uh, when William H. Blathing, commander of Vicksburg Post No. 7, made an announcement for the annual Memorial Day celebration, he included in the invitation uh, to the proceedings, quote, all ex-Federal soldiers and sons of veterans and all ex-Confederate soldiers and sons of veterans. This is from the Vicksburg Evening Post, May 30th, 1891. Uh, later that same year, the GAR Post uh, held a party in which the newspaper headlines claimed that, quote, federal and Confederate veterans meet in a pleasant celebration. Uh, this party included speeches by Confederate veterans G.G. Pegram, uh, uh, which was, quote, well received by the audience. Uh, for Thanksgiving 1891, the Union and Confederate veterans held a Thanksgiving campfire which included the singing of Dixie and the recitation of the poem Lines on a Confederate Note, which was a mournful lament uh, on the defeat of the Confederacy. So the Vicksburg Post had really uh, made great pains to try and ingratiate itself with the local citizenry, and uh, this creation of black GAR Post was threatening that. And so they were going to come out against it uh, very strongly. At the 25th National Encampment of the, of the Grand Army of the Republic uh, held at Detroit, Michigan from August 5th to 7th, 1891, this controversy over black GAR posts was settled once and for all. 
There was great pressure on, to make the problem go away just by creating a separate department in Louisiana and Mississippi uh, for the black veterans, uh, separate but equal, which was uh, all the rage at the time. Um, this idea was given to a special committee for study, and after deliberation, they made the following recommendation. They said, during the fierce struggle for the life of the nation, we stood shoulder to shoulder as comrades tried. It is too late now to divide on the color line. A man who is good enough to stand between the flag and those who would destroy it when the fate of the nation was trembling in the balance is good enough to be the comrade of any department of the Grand Army of the Republic. No different rule has been or ever will be recognized by the survivors of the Union Army and Navy. No department should be established for any color or nationality. And when put to a vote, uh, this sentiment was uh, readily endorsed by the, the membership of the Grand Army of the Republic. And they did vote to uh, recognize all of the black uh, JR posts in the state of Mississippi. And then after this authorization by the National Encampment, the response from the white posts in the Department of, of Louisiana and Mississippi was quick. In May 1892, Frederick Speed, uh, who was at that time commander of the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi, ordered the white GAR post uh, to refuse to recognize the black posts. His justification for this was that, quote, the Negro posts are comprised of a motley crew, mainly of teamsters, cooks, officer servants, and camp followers, some of whom served in the Confederate Army, and no effort was made when the post was organized to determine whether they had been honorably discharged from the Federal Army and they should not have been recognized by the Grand Encampment. And as far as I can tell, there was no substance of these charges whatsoever. Um, all of the men from the, the African American JAR post that I've been able to uh, track, uh, served in the, in the Union Army, were honorably discharged, and so all of these charges were just, uh, were just made up. Uh, and in retaliation for Frederick Speed's uh, uh, order to ignore the black GAR post, uh, orders came down from the national headquarters of the GAR suspending Frederick Speed as commander of the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, suspended along with him were the senior vice commander and the junior vice commander, leaving all three top spots in the departmental uh, command structure vacant for the time being. And as Memorial Day approached in uh, May 1892, the Daily Commercial Herald in Vicksburg noted that, quote, this in all probability will be the last observance of Decoration Day in which white veterans will participate. The paper also snidely commented that, quote, the so-called Negro Grand Army Post will have a picnic at the cemetery in the morning, but the grounds will be reserved for whites after two o'clock by order from the War Department. The public generally are invited to testify by their presence on this occasion that the war is over. And following up on that, uh, the night of June 21st, 1892, Vicksburg Post Number 7 <clears throat> met, and a number of the members, not all of them, but some of them agreed to dissolve the post. The newspapers uh, noted that they were doing this, quote, rather than have themselves be put on an equality with Negroes. The white Grand Army organization in this city is a thing of the past. Now, not all the members of Vicksburg Post number, number 7 were in agreement with this. And in fact, the Post would, commin, would continue, would continue uh, after a number of the members had, uh, had quit. Uh, they would, take, uh, would continue under the leadership of Peter T. O'Shea, who was superintendent of the Vicksburg National Cemetery and a, a veteran of the, the Union Army. He would become the new commander of the Post. And it was still in existence as late as January 1896, but that's the last uh, mention I can find of it in the newspapers. It may have survived a little bit longer, but probably sometime around early 1896 is when it was going to fade out. Probably just opposition from the local uh, citizenry became too much for the remaining members. And uh, 
the gentleman shown here, Cornelius N. Uh, Boyer, was another one of uh, Vicksburg Post Number no. Seven's members who refused to leave and, and remain with the organization as long as it was still in existence in Vicksburg. While the white posts in uh, the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi were on the decline, uh, the number of African American posts uh, were, were, were rapidly growing and flourishing. And eventually there would be 20 posts in Mississippi, uh, most of them located in larger cities, but some were in rural areas where the African American population was high. And uh, this is a list here of all the, uh, the posts in the state that I've been able to document. There, there's possibly more, but so far these are the ones that I can definitely document. You've got you know, W.T. Sherman Post at Shelby, Mississippi, which I believe is Bolivar County, uh, Charles W. Cady Post in Jackson, the Ransom Post in Natchez, R.B. Elliott Post in Vicksburg, E.D. Edwards Post in Vicksburg, and that's not uncommon in larger cities to see more than one post, usually on opposite sides of the town just to make it convenient for the membership. Uh, John A. Logan Post in Natchez, Greenville Post in Greenville, uh, Dan Ullman Post in uh, Chatham, uh, T.W. Stringer Post in Bovina, uh, Fred Douglas Post in Warrington, uh, James Lynch Post in Port Gibson, uh, Duncansby Post in Duncansby, uh, Osterhaus Post in Edwards, uh, Ebenezer Post in, in Ebenezer, uh, General W.W. W. Dudley Post in Fayette, uh, General Allen Post in Glen Allen, uh, Vandergriff Post in Summit, uh, Leland Post in Leland, A.J. Smith Post in Horn Lake, and last but not least, Garfield Post in Vicksburg. And a number of the uh, GAR posts in the state were named uh, after prominent black leaders uh, during the Reconstruction era or after white military officers uh, uh, that were very prominent or in, in many cases that it had uh, led uh, African-American troops uh, in combat. A good example is the R.B. Elliott Post Number no. 17 in Vicksburg. It was most likely named after Representative uh, Robert Brown Elliott who was an African-American congressman from South Carolina. And uh, you'll see this uh, very commonly in a number of the names of the Mississippi Post. Another example the J.R. members in uh, Chatham, uh, Washington County, named post number 28 after General Dan Ullman, who had led uh, United States colored troops at uh, the uh, siege of Port Hudson, Louisiana during the Civil War. Post number 30 in Bovina, Mississippi, was named for Thomas W. Stringer, uh, an African-American pastor who came to Mississippi during the Civil War to help aid uh, newly freed slaves. Uh, the Masonic Lodge in Vicksburg was also named for him, and in fact shown in this picture is the uh, banner from Stringer Lodge uh, in Vicksburg. And uh, this is part of our collections here in, at Dark Eyes in History. It's a beautiful, beautiful banner. Uh, it's an amazing piece of work. Uh, some other examples of uh, posts named for prominent uh, African Americans or, or uh, union leaders who had uh, been associated with African Americans. Um, there were posts named after Frederick Douglass, uh, James Lynch. Uh, the Vandergriff Post and Summit was named for Dr. Jo John Bernard Vandergriff of Louisiana, who had served in the 2nd Louisiana Infantry and the 1st Regiment New Orleans Volunteers, both of which were African American units. So these posts were making it very clear uh, um, that they were honoring uh, men that they, they respected and served under during the war. And there was also an auxiliary organization to the Grand Army of the Republic that was the National Women's Relief Corps, which was chartered in 1883. And this picture was taken in Port Gibson in 1890, and it shows members of the Grand Army of the Republic and the Women's Relief Corps celebrating Freedom Day in, in Claiborne County. And the primary goal of the National Women's Relief Corps was to perpetuate the memory of, the, of those who fought for the Union in the Civil War. And the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi of the Women's Relief Corps was organized in March of 1893. 
uh, although the first Mississippi uh, posts were not going to be uh, organized until about 1900. In 1909, the Mississippi chapters uh, petitioned the national headquarters to have its own department, uh, citing that the heavy expense of having to travel down to New Orleans for meetings was, uh, was uh, getting a little too much. And uh, this, uh, this petition was granted, and uh, the uh, Mississippi Department of the Women's Relief Corps was organized on December 18, 1909, with uh, Josephine C.C. C. Shelton of Natchez uh, uh, as the, uh, uh, the head. And this is a list of the, the uh, Women's Relief Corps uh, posts in Mississippi that I've been able to find so far. Um, and in most cases, they, they follow along with the same towns where uh, the GAR posts were located. Because more than likely, if you had a GAR post, the wives of the members were going to form a, a Women's Relief Corps uh, organization to go along with it. And the JAR camps in Mississippi were involved in numerous political and civic activities on both a, a, a local, a state, and a national level. Uh, shown in the picture here is one of the Natchez posts of the Grand Army of the Republic uh, uh, standing in uh, formation about 1890. Unfortunately, I don't know which one of the posts it is. There were several in Natchez, and unfortunately the, the photograph is not identified, so I don't know exactly which one it is. In the 1890s, uh, the Charles W. Cady Post in Jackson and the R.B. Elliott Post in Vicksburg both endorsed the uh, passage of a service pension bill uh, by the U.S. Congress, which would grant a pension to every veteran of the Union Army who served in the Civil War. Uh, while this uh, service pension bill was never passed, a more liberal interpretation of the existing pension law did allow a lot more veterans to claim pensions and the number of pensioners grew from about 537,000 in 1890 to over 966,000 in 1893. And between 1890 and 1907, pension payments uh, to veterans and their widows totaled more than a billion dollars, which is a huge outlay for the federal government at the time. And uh, shown in this uh, pension application, uh, is a uh, application of widow Harriet Caswell of Vicksburg, whose husband Robert Caswell had served in Company H of the 3rd United States Colored Cavalry. He had uh, died in service at Memphis on December 24, 1864, and his widow was applying for a pension based on his, his service. And one of the most important uh, holidays for the Grand Army of the Republic was uh, Memorial Day. It was established by the National Commander, General John A. Logan, in 1868. He issued uh, General Order No. 11, designating May 30 as a day, quote, for the purpose of strewing the, with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. And the Mississippi Post were going to be very diligent about remembering Memorial Day and honoring Union dead uh, all during the year. This is the entrance to the Vicksburg National Cemetery, which was the scene of numerous Memorial Day observances by the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, the Vicksburg Evening Post on May 30th, 1890, wrote this account of the, the Memorial Day observance by the African-American GAR post in the city. They said, quote, at 1130, the colored GAR paraded the streets, coming down south to Washington and thence down the street. They were about 400 strong, and the front files were in full uniform with straw hats and badges, but the rear files were in ordinary dress with breast badge and occasionally a uniform coat or cap. Uh, the JAR Post also observed other important dates, such as Abraham Lincoln's birthday, uh, the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, also, uh, in fact, uh, for the celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1905, the local GAR post put an announcement in the local paper and said, quote, no Negro in this city who appreciates freedom can afford to be absent on this occasion. 
And then each year, the GAR also held national encampments, which were elaborate multi-day affairs that also often included camping out, uh, formal dinners, parades, memorial observances, and uh, a number of Mississippians did go to these national encampments. In fact, uh, this photograph here is from uh, the 1890, uh, it's from uh, uh, a an, an national encampment that was held in Colorado and uh, shown in the picture here, the first man on the left is John Ayers, who was a member of the Vandegrift Post in Summit. And then next to him is William uh, Rochester, who was a member of one of the, the Natchez posts of the GAR, and who would also go on to serve as departmental commander of the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi. And also shown in the inset here, this is the, a lot of departments would adopt their own unique badge so that they would be uh, distinctive when they, when they were at the national encampments. And this is the badge that was worn by the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi. And uh, this photo is courtesy of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum. They have one of these original badges in their, their collections, which is extremely rare. Uh, if you get a chance, I highly recommend going down to the Armed Forces Museum. They have an amazing collection. And this is just one of the, the many Civil War items that they have in their holdings. As time went on, the GAR uh, slowly began to uh, fade away as its membership uh, dropped off. Uh, the GAR held its last national encampment at Indianapolis, Indiana in 1949. There were six, six men there. In fact, th this picture in the inset shows the six members of the GAR that were able to make it to the, to the national encampment. Uh, shown on the statue here, uh, which is at Gettysburg, is uh, the last member of the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, Albert Wilson, uh, who passed away in 1956 at the age of 109. He was the last survivor of the approximately three million men who served in the Union Army during the Civil War. And I'm not certain when the JR in Mississippi became defunct. Uh, the only post I've been able to document its closing was uh, Ransom Post Number 16 in Natchez. They disbanded in 1933. And I would suspect the other, the other posts in the state were probably around the same time period because I'm not finding any, any mentions of them uh, in local newspapers or anything after the, after the early 1930s. And uh, I want to close with a quote from Jonathan Tarble, the, the first commander of the Department of Mississippi. And uh, this was kind of his, his motivation for starting the GAR in the state. And I'd just like to read this quote from him. And he said, Those who know with what care, patience, and perseverance I have watched over the introduction of the organization into Mississippi will need no assurance of my devotion to all the great principles on which it was founded, uncontaminated by partisan politics, pledged to one country and one flag, based upon fraternity, charity, and loyalty, the peaceful patriot and the social influences of the association have only to be known to be commended, with no other motive than to keep pace with the music of the Union, to cultivate the virtues referred to, and cherish the memories of those who gave their lives that the country might live. The Grand Army is destined not merely to permanent establishment, but general favor. Jonathan Tarble, May 28, 1870. And I, I would say in closing that the Grand Army of the Republic does live on, on uh, through its uh, uh, successor organization, the Sons of Union Veterans. Anyone uh, who is a descendant of a, a Union veteran or even just uh, a, uh, anyone that's interested in, uh, in the organization can join as an associate member. Um, unfortunately, there are no posts in Mississippi that I'm aware of, but there is a post in Memphis that's probably the closest one. In fact, I, I have plans to join that post myself as, uh, as soon as things return to normal around here. But uh, if anyone has any questions at this time, I will be glad to answer them if I can. There are indeed questions. Huh? The names of the lodges sparked several. Um, Sarah Campbell asks, do you know any more about the occupation or business of Cornelius M. Boyer or what his service history entailed? I do have uh, some more information on him. Uh, let me see. I think I've got 
at least his unit here with me. I've got more information on him in my files back at the office. If they're interested, they can contact me directly uh, by my email, uh, J Gambro. That's the letter J G I A M B R O at M D A H dot M S dot gov. And we'll we'll put that in the comments of the live stream. And if I can find it, I know I've got at least his unit here. At least I thought I did. I t t if, just have, if they will contact me, I'll be yeah. glad to send them all the information I've got on him. Because I, I think I've got quite a bit. That's good. And we can yeah. also post it here in the yeah. comment as this. Uh, Deirdre Payne says, T.W. Stringer, post 30 at Bavina, possibly resurrected in Jackson as the Masonic Temple. Maybe the temple in Jackson was named after a son. I see that it is M.W. Stringer, not T.W. Stringer. Yeah. So. Oh. Um, Jim Woodrick asks, what was the outcome of the court case? Did the GAR posts receive the insurance money? As far as I'm aware, they did not because it was a legal technicality. They, the the uh, insurance uh, was set to run out at 12 o'clock on the day of the fire, 12, I think 12 p.m. And the fire happened like six hours later. But on the outside of the, uh, the insurance uh, the form they had signed, they had written the wrong date. They had written like the next day. So the post was claiming that it was in effect until the next day, but while all the information on the inside gave the correct date of the, the end of the, the policy, yeah. which was at 12 o'clock. So I think the, the uh, uh, Supreme Court of Mississippi, which where it was appealed up to, uh, ruled with the, the insurance company that uh, in, it indeed had expired when it said it expired. So they were not able to, to, uh, to collect on their claim. From Vicksburg, Bill Justice asks, who was E.D. Edwards? Unfortunately, I don't know. I have not been able to find out who he was. The name is so common, and without a full first name, I have, I've I've done a lot of research, but I have not been able to determine exactly who he was and what his significance was to that local post. Yeah. Robert Seaforth asks, uh, well, he says, first great presentation. Then he asks, were the GAR posts in Natchez responsible for the origin of the long-running Memorial Day observances there? I don't know for certain, but more than likely they were. Yeah. Because Memorial Day was such an important uh, holiday to the... Grand Army of the Republic. Um, let's see. Let me scroll through and get some of these. All right. Sarah Campbell asks again, did the white chapters cease activities after the 1890-91 ruling by the National GAR refusing to set up a separate department? The, the, there was only one white Mississippi GAR post in Mississippi. That was Vicksburg Post Number 7. A lot of the members did uh, leave after the national encampment had, uh, had uh, certified that the, the African American Post could join the department, but a number of the membership did stay with the Vicksburg Post number seven, and it did continue in existence up until about 1896, and that's hmm. the, last, the last record I can find of it uh, um, in, the, in, in Vicksburg. So it, it's probably went out of existence right about 1896. Yeah. But it did, it, went, it continued for several more years after that ruling. Uh, one last comment, I guess, not really a question from Bill Justice, who says, in 1909, the E.D. Edwards Post donated an unknown amount of money to the Lincoln Farm Association to build the memorial that now stands in Abraham Lincoln Birthplace National Historic Park. It was sent by Robert Crane, who was secretary of the Post, the Lincoln Farm Association took meticulous records. Uh, he says he has a copy of the card. Robert Crane is buried in Vicksburg National Cemetery. Oh, so, that, that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Uh, just an example of how you can not have folks in the room with you, but still have a, yeah. a, a good interactive <laughs> presentation yes. 
with uh, information flowing both ways. We have come to the top of another hour. Jeff, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you all who viewed this. And uh, if you have further questions, do feel free to either type them in here or post them on the Facebook event. We'll get Jeff to answer them and uh, get back to you. Thank you all, and I hope that we see you next week. And thank you, Jeff. Oh, thank you.